Don't hold anything back. Let your voice out loud. Come on, let your voice out loud. Hallelujah. Come on, let it out loud. Let there be an eruption of praise and worship right now in this room. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, don't hold back. Don't hold back. Let it out loud. Hallelujah. 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 Now would you lift those hands all across this auditorium. Lift them. Lift your head up toward heaven. Open your mouth one more time and just begin to pray until you pray in the Holy Ghost just a moment. Would you do it? Shouldn't take but a second or two. Why don't you let your voice out and pray till you pray in the Holy Ghost. There is such a mighty anointing of God in this room tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are miracles unfolding in this room tonight. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Bounds, thank you for obeying the Holy Ghost. There is such a prophetic anointing in this room tonight. There are miracles of healing that have already happened. And there are miracles of healing that are about to happen. There are miracles of deliverance that have already taken place in this room. And there are yet more miracles of deliverance that are going to happen before we leave. God has already spoken to pastors and leaders in this room tonight. And the Lord is still yet going to speak to pastors in this room tonight. You believe it? Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say something really powerful is about to happen in this room. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Such an honor and privilege to be at the movement conference. I'm sorry that. I had to come all the way to Maryville, Tennessee to preach to myself. My prayer tonight is that I practice what I preach. And what I'm about to preach to you, my prayer is that God, I do more than talk about it. But God, help me be a doer of what I'm about to preach. I turn your attention to the book of Luke chapter 5. Such an honor to be at such an incredible church. We give honor to Bishop Carpenter and Sister Carpenter, Pastor and Sister Erickson, and all the staff here at FAC Marable. We are so honored in our organization to have a general superintendent with such a passion for missions. And I appreciate the fact that you love missions. To all of our speakers, God has spoken already in this place so powerfully yesterday and today. German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer said one time, whenever we open our Bibles, we should say to ourselves, here and now God is about to speak to us. And as every preacher this week has opened this holy book, God has spoken to us. We're going to be turning to Luke chapter 5 and then John chapter 21. I'm so sorry that my wife is not able to be with us here. My mother-in-law had surgery this week and my wife was so disappointed that she wasn't able to be back in her home district, the tri-state district. But I know they are watching via the live stream. Luke chapter 5 and verse 4. Now, when he had left speaking... He said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. 
And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. John 21 and 3, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. And they say unto him, we also go with thee. And they went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, children, have ye any meat? They answered him, no. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship and ye shall find. They cast therefore and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Verse number nine, as soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. Jesus saith unto them, bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. I want to preach tonight, cast out the nets, cast out the nets. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say, cast out the nets. Why don't you look at somebody behind you, would you do that in the row behind you? And say, cast out, cast out the nets. Now before you set your body down, set your Bible down and lift your hands one more time and say, God... As we open this holy book, I believe you are about once again to speak to us tonight. I open my heart, my mind, my spirit to hear the word, to hear the word of the Lord in this place. In Jesus' name. Thank you for standing. God bless you. You may be seated. While many important events in the life of Jesus unfolded in Jerusalem... Most of his ministry took place within a stone's throw of the Sea of Galilee. In fact, he taught more than half of his parables and performed most of his miracles in the vicinity of this freshwater lake. Oftentimes, this body of water was his classroom and a boat was his pulpit. This Sea of Galilee in the New Testament actually is called by three different names. Most commonly, the Sea of Galilee, also the Sea of Tiberias, and the Lake of Gennesaret. Today, its shores are mostly deserted, except for the town of Tiberias. But in Jesus' day, nine towns surrounded the Sea of Galilee, and none of them had less than a population of 15,000 people. This 14-mile-long, 9-mile-wide lake is the setting for our story today. There are actually two stories in the Gospels about a great catch of fish on the Sea of Galilee. One at the commencement of Jesus' ministry found in Luke 5, and the second in John 21 after his resurrection. And in both of those stories, the disciples fished all night long, but did not catch one fish. Not one fish. Keep in mind, these were fishermen by trade. They were not novices. They were experienced anglers. They were seasoned sailors. They had fished with their fathers and with their grandfathers. They had, as children, walked all along these shores, skipping rocks into the water and picking up pieces of driftwood. They knew these waters well, including all of the honey holes and the places where fish would likely congregate. But even with all of their experience and with all of their skill, they toiled all night and caught nothing. Jesus finds them that morning on the shore washing their nets, a drudgery at any time, but especially after a long night of failure. Jesus says to them, launch out into the deep and cast out your nets. 
Peter might have answered, now, master, I, I'm a fisherman. You're a carpenter. You, you should really let me deal with this. I know the best times to fish. And nighttime is when the fish are best caught and not when the sun is rising in this morning time. Nevertheless, at thy word. And Peter obeys the command of Jesus. And he cast out the net. I love to fish. And I feel like I'm, I'm pretty good at it. Now this is a little out of character for me. Because truthfully I am, not, I am not a boastful kind of person. But the truth is I usually outfish those that I'm in the boat with. I'm not usually a boastful person if you know me. But the truth is. That I usually better those who are in the boat with me. Whether that be my father-in-law who I often take fishing. Or Josh Wilson, most of you know him. Or my son Chandler. Or you know how much I love and respect you, Brother Osborne. <laughs> you want to know my secret. Now you might think it has something to do with the lure that I'm using. Or... The kind of rod or reel or gear that I have in my hand or perhaps some special technique. And certainly there are times when success has somewhat to do with those things. But that is not my secret. My consistent outperformance of my angler competition usually has nothing to do with the lure that I'm using or the bait that I'm using or the quality of my gear. Are you ready? This is deep. Do you have that page opened in your book that says inspirational thoughts? This is a good place to write this down. This is really deep. I have my lure or my bait in the water more than they do. My son Chandler, his line in lure is usually in the tree. My, my father-in-law is taking his sweet time. Uh, before he cast again, sipping his coffee. Josh Wilson is checking Facebook or more likely checking text messages from Bishop Carpenter. But not me. The second, the second that that lure surfaces near the boat, within a split second, I have recast that lure back into the water. The rest of the guys in the boat, no, they're checking Instagram, they're sipping coffee, they're tying on a new lure every third cast. It's no wonder that I generally outfish them. My lure is in the water more than theirs. And if my line is in the water 25% more time than theirs, then at least over the long run, I'm going to catch 25% more fish than they do. One thing is certain, Peter. You will not catch fish. Fish with your nets on the shore. Peter, it doesn't matter how good a fisherman you are. It doesn't matter how you've come from a long line of Galilean fishermen. It doesn't matter that you grew up splashing around every cove in Lake Gennesaret. Dry nets catch no fish. Folded nets catch no fish. Nets lying on the sand catch zero fish. 100% of the time. I know they were discouraged. I know they had toiled all night. But the first thing that Jesus said is launch out into the deep and get your nets into the water. Cast out the nets. Say it with me. Cast out the nets. Too many Christians are like these disciples. They've got their nets lying on the shore. Too many churches have their nets lying in a pile or neatly folded on the shelf. They have nets that are not in the water. Dry nets catch no fish. Folded nets catch no fish. Abandoned nets catch no fish. The great catch of fish in this story was a miracle of God. But the miracle did not happen as long as the nets were dry. We have got to get the nets in into the water. We've got to get the gospel into the water. We've got to get the message into the world. We've got to get the light out of the darkness, out from under the bushel, and into the darkness. A 
around us. We've got to get the salt out of the shaker. We've got to get the power of God outside the four walls of the church building. Cast out the nets. Cast out the nets. Dry nets. Catch no fish. You understand the gospel does no good until it's preached to the lost. This message does no good as long as it's kept private. The power of the Holy Ghost doesn't heal until it gets around somebody who's sick. The power of the Holy Ghost doesn't deliver the captive until it gets around the captive. It doesn't open prison doors until it's taken to the bound. It doesn't give sight until it's shared with the blind. We've got to get the nets into the water. Your neighbor again say we got to cast out the nets nets do no good in the boat we've got to get the nets into the water this huge catch of fish was a miracle it was a God thing. Jesus demonstrated that he had power over even the fish of the sea. But Jesus did not bring 10,000 fish jumping into the boat. He directed the fish into the net. The net that these men had cast into the water. He used the faculty of the fishermen. He did not circumvent the hands and feet of men and women. Peter had to cast out the nets. Yes, it was a miracle. Yes, it was a divine catch. But Peter had to cast out the nets. God could write the gospel message across the sky in fiery letters for the whole world to see. But he has chosen to use men and women to carry the message of the gospel. Cast out the nets and he'll do the miraculous. I still feel that prophetic anointing Brother Browns was talking about. I've come to tell somebody if you'll get the net in the water God will do a miracle in your life if you'll get the net hallelujah He'll do the miraculous. He'll draw all men unto himself, but he will not circumvent the faith nor the action of his church. Launch out into the deep and let down the nets. Miracles happen when we cast out the nets. Miracles don't happen for churches when the nets are folded neatly on the shelf. Miracles happen for churches whose nets are in the water. We will see the hand of God. We will see the works of God. We will see the miraculous power of God when we get the nets into the water. I've quoted I've quoted the promises of Mark 16 since I was a young teenager wearing out Lee Stone King tapes from Brother Hendricks Camp Meeting in Madisonville, Kentucky. I, I can hear Brother Phil, I can hear Brother Stone King's voice right now. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. But listen to me, I'm afraid we have taken that promise out of context. That promise was not for everyone. The promise of authority over devils and power over sickness and disease and supernatural protection over the venom of hell or the poison of our culture. Those promises were not made to people who were sitting comfortably on the pews within the four walls of the church. That promise was made to people who were casting their nets into the water. Maybe you ought to read a couple verses prior where Jesus said, go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. These signs shall follow them that believe. We mustn't separate the command to go with the promise of the miraculous. If we'll cast out the nets, if we'll get engaged in reaching the lost, then we're going to have power to cast out devils. Then we're going to have power to lay our hands on the sick and see them recover. Oh my God. We've got to get the nets in the water. That promise was not made to people with their nets folded and on the shelf. 
I say this with utmost respect, but it does not matter what happens in here if we are not casting out the nets. It doesn't matter that the praise team killed it or the band was out of the park or the preacher hit a home run if our nets are folded up sitting on a shelf somewhere. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the praise team nailed it, if our nets are piled up in the corner. It doesn't matter if we walk out of here on Sunday and say, my, my, didn't we have good church today? If our nets are dry, if our nets are lying on a sandy shore, we got to get our nets into the water. It doesn't matter how many Bible verses I can quote if my nets are dry. It doesn't matter, sir that you're paying your tithes, living a godly life and faithful on Wednesday and Sunday. If your nets are washed and folded, Jesus is saying, launch out into the deep and let down your nets. We've got to get the nets into the water. We've got to get the nets into our community. We've got to get the nets into our schools. We've got to get the nets into our college campuses. We've got to get the net into our offices. We've got to get the nets into our factories. We've got to get the nets into our job sites. We've got to get them in the neighborhood. We've got to get them in the prisons. We've got to get them in the shelters. We've got to get them in the rehab centers. We've got to get the nets into the water. Cast out the nets to your family, to your friends to your co-workers, to your neighbors, to the strangers we meet. Hallelujah. Cast out your nets. Your miracle. Oh, I feel that prophetic anointing Brother Bounds was talking about. Your, your, your miracle is about to happen if you'll just get your nets in the water. Listen to me. There is a miracle about to happen in your church if you will get the net into the water. I feel that spirit of prophecy. I said a miracle is about to happen in your city if you'll just get the net into the water. A miracle revival is about to happen if you'll just get the net into the water. God will do the miraculous, but you got to get the net into the water. I feel like a miracle of provision of divine provision is about to happen for your church but remember the coin is in the fish's mouth and until you get the net into the water you're not going to see the miracle of provision God's going to do a miracle I feel like there's a miracle revival about to happen for somebody I feel like there's a miracle harvest about to happen to somebody I feel like there's a miracle harvest of, of, of backsliders a miracle move of restoration that is about to happen. It's waiting. It's waiting. It's waiting on you and me to get the nets into the water. Cast out. Cast. Cast out the net. Jesus said, cast out the nets. Plural. Look what Peter did. Read it. He said, I'll let down the net. Singular. He cast out one net. The harvest that God had in mind was bigger than what Peter was doing. He was casting out a net. Jesus said, cast out the nets. And as a result, they could not accommodate what God was about to bring in. Cast out the nets. It speaks of more than one person. It speaks of more than one ministry. It speaks of more than one method. Not just one net, but many nets. Divorce recovery ministry. It's a net, cast it out. Grief share, it's a net, cast it out. Breaking the chains ministry, it's a net, cast it into the water. Addiction recovery ministry, it's a net, get it into the water. Home Bible studies, it's a net, 
Get it into the water. Ministries mentoring young men and women. It's a net. Get it into the water. Did I say home Bible studies? It's a net. Get it into the water. Homeless ministry. It's a net. New parent support group. It's a net. Did I say home Bible study? It's a net. Get it into the water. Neighborhood block parties. It's a net. Prison ministry. It's a net. Hispanic ministry. It's a net. Online community prayer. It's a net. Get it into the water. Women's shelters. It's a net. Get it into the water. P7 clubs. It's a net. Get it into the water. Funeral ministry. It's a net. Get it into the water. Making meals and delivering them to the factory. It's a net. Get it into the water. Did I say home Bible studies? It's a net. If you'll get the net into the water, God is going to do a miracle. Churches with their nets folded in the corner of the boat are not reaching their world. We've got to get the nets into the water. Tell your neighbor one more time, cast out. Pastor Ball, I've tried. I've tried. Why were the disciples on the shore washing their nets? They answer the question for us. They say to the Lord, but Jesus, we fished all night. And we haven't caught a thing. To which Jesus responds. Launch out into the deep and let down your nets. But Lord, I tried that already. It didn't work. Dry nets are sometimes the result of discouragement. It's sometimes the result of frustration and failure. I've tried, but it doesn't work. There aren't fish there. People aren't interested. I've invited. I've testified. I've witnessed. Nothing has happened. Jesus said, I know, I know that you fished all night and didn't catch anything. But I'm telling you again, cast out the nets. You know what Jesus was really saying to them? Three words. Do it again. But Lord, we fished all night and we haven't caught anything. Jesus said, do it again. Do it again. And Peter says, okay, Lord. Peter was on the same boat. Hallelujah. The same group of men, the same lake, handling the same nets as the fruitless night before. But this time, wow. But this time, he cast the net out. And when he did, he felt something. Surely... He must have thought, he must have thought, I've got hung up. I've got hung up on a stump or I've got hung up on a rock. Hallelujah. But suddenly the net began to move a little bit. And they thought, this doesn't feel like a stump. This doesn't feel like a rock. And the net starts moving. And he says, hey, Andrew, come over here and help me a little bit. And they start pulling on that net. Before long, the two of them can't even pull it up. And they start calling for some other brothers. Hey, you don't have to come and, and help us. And can you imagine? Can you imagine the first glimpse that Peter had of that net at the surface of the water? There were more fish in that net than he had ever seen in a net in his entire life. Oh, brother, sister, what a mighty difference. Obedience to Jesus produced. Oh, what a mighty, what a mighty difference. Obedience to the word of the Lord produced. Do you hear it? Can you hear what the Holy Ghost is speaking in this conference tonight? Do it again. Can you understand? Can you feel the prophetic word of God that's been in this room all night? Do it again. Share the message.
message again. Teach the word again. Share the testimony again. Pray again. Pray for that unsaved child again. Call that backslider again. Do it again. Dream again. Invite again. Cast out the nets. Jesus knows you've tried before. But he is speaking a fresh word to you at this movement conference. Cast out the nets. He knows your church has tried. Do it again. He knows your church has prayed for harvest. Do it again. He knows there have been times when you pulled up empty nets. Do it again. It's easy, it's easy to fold up nets during a pandemic. Thank you for standing. You can be seated a moment. For two years, our focus has been on self-preservation, survival. We've been locked down, locked in, masked up. You know, people don't think much about fishing when you're in the middle of a storm. But hear the word of the Lord tonight. Pastor, it's time to get the net back into the water. Brother Tony said it last night. It's harvest time. Brother Bounds said it earlier. It time is now. I want to tell some pastor who's been locked up and locked in and masked up till you wish you never heard the word COVID-19 again. It's time to get the nets back into the water. Do it again. It's time to get the whole Bible study chart back out. Do it again. It's time to go visit folks I know for the last two years nobody answered their door I know for the last two years nobody wanted to talk to anybody because they had a mask over their face but I've come with a fresh word from the Lord for this conference do it again get the nets into the water get the nets into the water oh these guys are so awesome Jesus, he's on the shore. I didn't know I was going to get in this. Just, just don't take it up in the ceiling with me in it. You can be seated just a minute. And they had apparently been casting the net on the left side of the boat. Or maybe in the, off the front of the boat. Or maybe off the back of the boat. But Jesus says, cast the net off the right side, right side of the boat. Peter, Peter says, the right side, yeah, right side. Right, right here? No, back up just a little bit, okay. Try not to fall out of the boat. Right, right, right here, Lord, just, just, just move back a little bit, over just a little, that's it, Peter. Now, right there, Right there. Cast the net. We are creatures of habit. We get stuck in a rut of always casting the nets in the same place. With the same people. In the same way. The same approach. The same setting. The same method. I think Jesus is saying, hey, why don't you try the other side of the boat? I think the Lord in this meeting is trying to direct some people here today to cast into some new water. 
I, I, was, I was halfway between asleep and awake when I felt the Lord just, I like what you said, download into my spirit just this word. Won't you tell some folks to cast the net into some new water? I don't know what that means for everybody in here. I don't really know who I'm talking to, but I feel like somebody needs to hear the word of the Lord tonight, that the Lord is trying to direct you to cast the net into some new water. Why don't you be led by the Holy Ghost? Because this story speaks to us of being led by the Spirit. Oh Lord, help us hear your voice. You believe God can direct you? Do you believe God can speak to you? Do we still believe in the gift of word of knowledge and word of wisdom and discerning of spirits? Do we still believe that God can speak to his people through the preached word, through the spoken word, through the written word? He can still speak to a man of God or a woman of God in a dream or in a vision trying to direct you. Jesus knows where the fish are. Jesus knows where you need to cast your net. Somebody needs to cast the net into some new water. I don't know if that's a neighboring community. I don't know if that's another ethnic group. Oh Lord. I wasn't going to get on the subject of missions or I'll be preaching all night long. But you don't have to go to Central America to have a ministry to Hispanics. <laughs> you don't have to go to Asia to have a ministry among the Burmese. I promise you, they're in your backyard. You just got to get the net into the water. You just got to cast, you just got to open your eyes and realize, hey, I've been throwing the net in the same spot. Maybe I need to turn around and cast the net into some new water. Maybe there's a new ethnic group of people that you haven't even thought about reaching yet. I'm here to prophesy to somebody. There's a miracle revival coming to your church if you'll just get the net into the water. He can speak to you. He can speak to you. Do you? I wasn't going to come down off the platform, but Brother Bounds did. I feel so much liberty tonight. You know how big the Judean desert was? 1,500. You can be seated. 1,500 square kilometers. I want to tell you that an Ethiopian man in a single chariot in the middle of a 1,500 square kilometer desert is a needle in a haystack. But the Bible says that the Holy Ghost speaks to Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. The Holy Ghost, Brother Thornton, speaks to Philip. He says, I just want you to go toward the south. And so he goes, okay. 1,500 square mile empty desert. He just starts going towards the south. Walks a little bit and the Holy Ghost says, just, just bear over to your right just a little. And he turns this way. Now, now just stay on that bearing and walk. And so he starts walking a little ways, doesn't see anything. Wonders why in the world I'm out here in the middle of the desert. Then the Holy Ghost says, you need to pick up the pace just a little bit. So he was kind of walking like this. So he starts walking like like this. Holy Ghost said, that's about the right pace. That's about the right speed. Now just head on that bearing. All of a sudden he looks up and he sees what he thought is a dust cloud, a storm, but it wasn't. It was the wheels of a chariot of an Ethiopian man who'd been reading the prophet Isaiah talking about the Christ, but he didn't understand what he was reading. Let me tell you what, the Holy Ghost led Philip in a 1,500 square mile desert right to a man who was ready to hear the gospel. I want to tell you, there is a Cornelius in your community right now. There is an Ethiopian in your community right now. Oh God, God, we got to be led by the Holy Ghost. 
Do you, does anybody know about the first, the first church in Europe? Let me see. First church in Europe? How it all got started? Paul says, I think I'm going to cast my net into some new water. I don't know why I keep going back to that because somebody needs to hear that tonight. You need to cast your net into some new water. So he goes down to this city that he's never been to before. And like any good church planter would do, the first thing he does is start praying. And so he says, I think I'm going to go down to the river and pray this morning. So he goes down to the river, Brother Carpenter, and he, he lifts his hands and starts praying. And the Holy Ghost says, Paul, wait, wait, wait just a minute. Don't pray right there. Paul says, Lord, what do you mean? Why don't you walk down the bank about 50 meters? Okay. So Paul walks down the bank a little bit farther, gets, gets a little ways down and stops and begins to pray. And the Holy Ghost said, just, just a little bit farther. So he walks down a little bit farther and he kneels down, raises his hands, and begins to pray. And like any good church planner, praying, he's praying in the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost speaks to him and says, there's nothing wrong with praying in the Spirit, but I think you need to pray with your understanding today. Paul says, well, okay. And, you know, I can pray in tongues and I can pray in my understanding. And so he starts praying in Hebrew and and the Holy Ghost taps him on the shoulder and says, uh, I don't want you to pray in Hebrew today. I want you to pray in a different language today. So he starts praying in Aramaic. And, and he's praying and the Holy Ghost taps him on the shoulder and speaks to his heart and says, why don't you pray in Greek today? So Paul, in an exact spot, where the Holy Ghost led him, kneeling down, praying in the language that the Holy Ghost inspired him to pray in, <clears throat> lifts his voice and begins to pray. Little does he know that right here around the tree, there's a woman named Lydia who happened to be a very influential woman in the city of Philippi. She happened to have a lot of money and she happened to have a, a big house and she happens to be just close enough to where Paul is praying that day to overhear him praying and because she overhears him praying she comes, she talks with him, he ministers to her, she's converted, baptized in Jesus name filled with the Holy Ghost and then says I have a pretty good house here in Philippi why don't we come start holding some meetings in my house do you know that the first church in the European region was started when Paul was led by the Holy Ghost to the precise location to pray where a woman in the city would overhear his prayers I want to tell you God is able to lead you to that hungry there is a hungry person in your community right Right now there is a Cornelius in your community right now and I'm just crazy enough to believe that God can send you right to his door yeah. Hallelujah. we were we we're praying in a prayer revival in our church we were in the church library it was just a small group that night there must have been eight or ten of us praying and we, we had a map of Carmel laid out on the floor. We were all on our hands and knees and had our hands on that map. And we were praying, God, give us revival in our city. Help us cast out the nets. And when we started praying, I, I noticed this street that was right, right down and across from our, our, our church. And I noticed that little neighborhood. And I put my hand on it. And we started praying that neighborhood. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost speaks in a, 
message in tongues. Just these, just these five words. Last house on the left. Last house on the left. Well, I've been around long enough to know that meant something. And I've been praying for that street. So I jumped up and I grabbed three or four of those guys. And I said, come on, we're going on a little prayer field trip. And we, we walked out the church, and walked down the street, uh, four or 500 yards and to that street. And we turned and went up that street. Where do you think we went? We went to the last house on the left. There wasn't anybody home, but we, we, we stopped in that yard and we just began to pray over that house. I didn't even know who lived there. We just began to pray over that house and just began to pray, God, whoever lives here, just, I believe you've directed us to this place. I pray the Holy Ghost start moving on these folks. And well, I didn't think much more about it till Sunday rolls around and a family walks in the church that I've never seen before. And I, I go back and greet them and introduce myself and they introduce themselves. And I said, where are you from? And they said, oh, we live real close to the church. I said, where do you live? Well, we live right there on Ralston Street. I said, really? I said, what house? I said, last house on the left. Last house. I'm going to tell you, the Holy, if the Holy Ghost can lead Paul to the very spot on the riverbank that Lydia could overhear him, if the Holy Ghost can lead Philip in a 1,500 kilometer square mile desert right to a man who's reading the book of Isaiah and saying to himself, my, I wish there was somebody who could explain to me what this verse of scripture means. If the Holy Ghost can lead some men praying to the last house on the left, God can lead you to that man at your work. God can lead you to that woman in the neighborhood. God can lead you. Oh my Lord, I want you to lift your hands right now. I want you to lift your voice and say, God, lead me. God, I've got to hear your voice. God, I've got to hear your voice. Lord, lead us. Lead us by the Holy Ghost. In the name of the Lord, I pray you direct pastors to new water right now. I pray you direct saints of God to new water right now. I pray you lead us when we go out from this conference and even before we leave this city. I pray you orchestrate our steps. I pray we hear a voice, the voice of the Lord in our heart, directing us, leading us, guiding us. I believe there's somebody sitting in a chariot right now saying, I wish somebody could explain this one God message to me. Come on, pray with me just a minute. I'm almost done, but let's pray. Let's pray just a minute. There's a new community that God is directing you to cast your nets into. There is a new ethnic group that God is directing you to cast your nets to. There is a neighbor. Oh God, I got to I got to get, I got to get my net into the water. God doesn't care how good I can preach if I got dry nets. God doesn't care how talented you are if you got dry nets. I told you I'm preaching to myself. I'm so convicted. I'm so convicted. Right before, right before the pandemic, I was getting ready to go to the Philippines, preach a general conference. I love to travel. On the day, Brother Thornton, when I'm getting ready to get on a plane, man, I'm, there's a bounce in my step, and I'm ready to go. I love it. I love it, Brother Stumbo. And I was wheeling my... Wheeling my little carry-on. Yes, I can go 13 days to Papua New Guinea on one carry-on. I wheel my little carry-on. I was going out to my car to put my, my suitcase in the trunk. To head to the airport, get on a plane. When the Holy Ghost, God talks to me funny. He, he goes, what you doing? I know I'm kind of crazy, but that's, that's how God speaks to me sometimes. Just like, what, what you doing? And I said, Lord, you know what I'm doing. I'm going to the Philippines. I'm going to preach general conference. 
The Lord said, oh, oh, you are. I said, yeah. About that time, Brother Carpenter, I look up and my neighbor had just opened his front door and was walking to the mailbox. And the Holy Ghost said, so let me get this straight. You're going to fly halfway around the world to preach in the Philippines. But your next door neighbor has not heard the gospel. I've never been more convicted in my life. I made, I made it my commitment. I've got to cast the net out to my neighbors. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what kind of preaching engagements you've got. It doesn't matter how your praise team can nail it and the band can rock it. If you got your nets folded up on a shelf somewhere, we got to get the nets into the water. God lead us. God direct us. Give us a passion for the lost. I'm almost done. You you can be seated. You can stand. I'm I'm almost done. I, I tell them at home, just start playing, and that'll wind me down. When they get to the shore, they drag this miraculous draw of fish to the sandy shore. Jesus does something so interesting. He says, count the fish. So Peter begins to count the fish. And when he counts them all and gets a total, Jesus says, how many fish are in the net? Peter says, 153. What an obscure number, right? I mean, I, if it were 40, you know, we'd, we'd be shouting. We'd be like, woo, you know. My Lord, if it were 120, you know, you know we'd be preaching camp meetings with that. 70, you know, that, that makes sense. 153. What, what, a, what an obscure number. 153. Historians say that in the Sea of Galilee in Jesus' day, there were 153 species of fish and aquatic creatures in the Sea of Galilee. And so when they pulled in the net, it had in it every species of fish that was in that water. There was not a kind of fish in that lake that was not in the net. The net reached every kind. This gospel has the power to reach every person. No one is unreachable. There is not a kind of person in this world that cannot be reached with the gospel. Don't you ever underestimate the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The nets of the gospel have the power to reach every kind of person. True revival brings every kind. You know, us church folk, we struggle sometimes with a rotten attitude. We may not verbalize it, but we too often have it in our heart. We want people just like us. We want people who fit into our mold. We don't want people that upset our comfort zone. But a God-given revival will bring souls of every kind. What God wants to give our churches is a revival that brings all 153 kinds of fish. The rich, the poor, the uneducated, the educated, male, female, even those who are confused about what they are. The free, the addicted, the religious, the atheist, the agnostic, the Muslim, the Buddhist, blacks, whites, Hispanics, Asians, Middle Easterners, God help us, Democrats. Republicans. If you want a revival church, you better quit preaching politics. Ooh. 
Now I'm meddling. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now I'm meddling. The true revival is going to bring in Democrats. It's going to bring in Republicans. It's going to bring in Libertarians. It's going to bring in Socialists. It's going to bring in every sort because the gospel draws every kind. True apostolic revival draws people of all sorts. It brings in people with issues. It brings in people with baggage. It brings people whose worldview is different from ours. People who know nothing of God or his ways or his word. That's revival. That's the gospel now. The gospel net, it doesn't bring, it doesn't haul in neatly trimmed scale debone fillets. Revival that brings in one kind of fish, that kind of revival doesn't exist. An apostolic church that's only interested in one species of fish is not an apostolic church at all. True apostolic revival brings in every kind. And that's the revival that God wants to bring. That's the kind of revival God's going to give you if you'll just get your net into the water. Are you ready? Are you ready for harvest? Are you ready to cast out? I close with this verse. And Jesus Walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. They were fishermen. It's who they were. They were fishermen. Now sometimes I invite people to go fishing with me. And I know they're going because they're my friend, not because they like to fish. Sometimes they humor me and they go fishing, but they're not fishermen. A fisherman is a rare breed of person. You ever heard that phrase? One more cast. When my father-in-law is begging me, Matthew, I'm ready to go home. When Josh, who doesn't even take the fish off his own line, I have to take the fish off for him because he's terrified of fish. You know, he, after 45 minutes, he's like, come on, let's go. When, when my son is like, Dad, I'm hungry. It's 29 degrees and sleeting. Come on. And I'm, Brother Osborne knows he's a fisherman. Me and Brother Osborne are like, just one more cast. There's, there's something about a fisherman. It's, it's not what they do. It's who they are. My prayer today is God... Make me a fisher of men. Not just what I do. Not just because I go to movement conference and get fired up listening to Timothy Lee. Not, not, not just because I, I get some fresh motivation. No, oh, something deeper than that, God. I want you to make me a fisher of men. I don't care. You know, fishermen, they don't care. They don't care if their back's tired because they've been standing in the river all day. They don't care if their arms are sore because they've been cranking that reel for six hours. They don't care because they're fishermen. One more cast. I'm not deterred. That, that's a fisherman. God, make us fishers of men. Now, I want you to take that net. I want you to take that net that, that that usher, that greeter gave you. I want you to clench it in your fist. And I want you to storm this altar right now. And I want you to throw that hand with that net up into the air. And I want you to say, oh God, make me a fisher of men. Make me a fisherman. Let it be something more than I do. It's not just something I do out of obligation. It's not just something I do because it's my job description. Oh God, make me a fisher of men. Make me a fisher of men. Come on, that's it. There's a transformation in the Holy Ghost. 
the Holy Ghost is going to transform us. The Holy Ghost is going to put something deep, deep in our spirit. God, give us a love for souls. Give us a love, a love for the lost. Give us a passion for lost souls. Give us a passion for our neighbor. Give us a passion to reach our coworker. Give us a passion to reach our family. Give us a passion to reach that stranger in the supermarket. That man in line at the bank. That man on the treadmill next to me at the gym. That woman, that woman next to me in the supermarket. That person next to me in the checkout line at Walmart. Cast out the net! Cast out the nets! Do it again! Do it again! Do it again! Come on, do it again. Visit again. Pray, pray again. Call them again. Knock on their door again. Teach them again. Visit them again. Pray for them again. Talk to them again. Love them again. Do it again. Do it again. Next few moments, the only sound in this auditorium is the sound of prayer. I want you to lift your voice with me right now. Come on, I want you to lift your voice. Just for a moment. There's a sound of travail. It's about to break loose in this place. There's a groaning in the spirit that's about to come because there's a new level of passion for souls that's being birthed in this room right now. Let your voice out. Come on, that's it. Let your voice out. There's something being birthed in the spirit. A passion for lost. A passion for souls. A passion for the gospel. Come on, that's it. Let your voice out. Intercessors, let your voice out. Come on, intercessors, let your voice out. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. In the name of Jesus. By the power of Jesus' name. By the power. In the name of Jesus, let fear go. In the name of Jesus, intimidation go. In the name of Jesus, out. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, inferiority complexes, get out. In the name of Jesus, feelings of being unqualified, get out. In the name of Jesus, fear go, intimidation go, condemnation go. In the name of Jesus, there's an anointing on you to reach the lost. You are equipped to reach the lost. The gospel net is in your hand. Do not be intimidated. Do not be fearful. Do not be intimidated. Do not be anxious. Do not be fearful. The gospel net is in your hand. The power of God is upon you. Go, go in the name of Jesus. Go into the world. Go into all the world. Go and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils in my name. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover in my name. In my name. They shall speak with new tongues in my name. They shall have a authority over the vipers of hell and the poison of this culture in the name of Jesus go cast out your net throw your net into the water